Okay, in chapter, uh, you, you actually may be a bit surprised as we go through this chapter that um, actually learning occurs in many different ways. And psychologists have uh, researched many different ways that we indeed do learn. So let's take a look. So first of all, what is learning? So learning is, re refers to a relatively enduring change in our behavior or knowledge as a result of our experience. And uh, so some of the first uh, uh, ways of learning that were researched early on in the evolution of psychology was what's called conditioning. And so conditioning is a process of learning associations between environmental events and behavioral responses. So uh, they mentioned three kinds here. We're going to take a look at all three of these uh, throughout this uh, discussion. First of all, uh, we'll take a look at classical conditioning. Then we'll look at operant conditioning and last um, observational learning. So first of all, classical conditioning and uh, Pavlov was one of the preeminent uh, researchers that looked at classical conditioning. And as some of you who um, may recognize his name, you know, and associate him with the experiments about the salivating dogs, when um, a bell was sounded and that caused dogs to salivate, well, this is this is the researcher that uh, was responsible for that. So this is how he did it. Um, in uh, I'm going to summarize this really briefly. And if you'd like, you know, feel free to pause the video here and uh, study this, and um, you know. Uh, become more acquainted with this. But basically it occurred in three steps. Um, you can see on the upper right, you know, uh, there's before conditioning, uh, there was a dog and uh, then the sound of a bell ringing. And the bell was called a neutral stimulus because it did not cause the dog to salivate. But then if you look right below that, then you'll see what's called the UCS, and that actually stands for unconditioned stimulus. And uh, so that creates a natural reflex in the dog, which is for the dog to salivate. And the dog's salivation is called the unconditioned response. So don't want you to get confused here. This does get a little confusing for students. Um, unconditioned means basically naturally occurring. It didn't have to be trained in any way. So um, the actual uh, dog food, you know, that would be an unconditioned stimulus and the dog salivating, that would be an unconditioned response to that food. Okay, now the next phase, phase two, during conditioning, what happens is Pavlov would, right before feeding the dogs, would ring the bell, the neutral stimulus. Then he would immediately let the dog eat. And he did this repeatedly through, you know, throughout a long period of time to where eventually, if you um, look down at the third phase called after conditioning, Pavlov was able to remove the dog food, ring the bell, and then the dog would salivate because the dog had associated the sound of the bell with the food. And so now, if you notice that the bell is actually called a conditioned stimulus. Remember, condition means trained. The dog was trained to respond or have, uh, have a reflex to the sound of the bell. And that's why it became a conditioned stimulus. And then um, uh, if you look over at the dog, the dog is salivating and that is called a conditioned response. It was trained to respond to the bell in that way. Okay, so there are certain you know factors that can affect conditioning, and uh, one thing that uh, is interesting is called stimulus generalization, and that just means uh, basically that when one learns to respond to a certain stimulus, one may actually generalize to. Um, and have the same response to a lot of other things that, that, the, that the person actually generalizes with that. Take, for instance, if you see the, um, this right here, you know, the, the photograph of this baby receiving an uh, inoculation and it's crying. Well, 
and then uh, if um, then you'll the the baby will upon later on whenever it goes to visit the doctor's office it will associate uh, visiting the doctor's office and seeing the people in the white coats with receiving an inoculation which is pain and so um, it generalized all doctor visits and all people dressed in white coats or you know uh, nurses uniforms with pain so that is called stimulus generalization and then uh, um, opposite that is what's called stimulus discrimination and that just means learning a response to a specific stimulus but not generalizing to other stimuli so that is just the opposite type of um, stimulus uh, response okay now this this term right here at the, on the upper part of the page uh, this is called higher order conditioning and all that means is if you remember take for instance um, if you remember that um, in Pavlov's Pavlov's experiment uh, the dog became conditioned to the sound of the bell and would salivate to the sound of a bell well then researchers thought well what would happen then if we even conditioned um, let's say the dog in this in this regard um, to become condi conditioned to something else adding another stimulus and um, I will just say like take for instance the sound of um, a cuckoo clock take for instance and so every time right before the dog would hear the sound of the bell they would sound a cuckoo clock and they do this enough times and eventually the dog upon hearing the cuckoo clock without hearing the bell would stim would uh, salivate and um, even though it was salivating like it used to remember originally to the to the actual dog food itself well this this um, adding a second stimulus and you know another um, be, which you know another conditioned stimulus they call that higher order conditioning okay now conditioning and classical conditioning you know um, eventually the conditioning can weaken and um, especially when the conditioned stimulus it's repeatedly presented without the unconditioned stimulus so uh, that kind of makes sense you know after a while the 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 classical conditioning effect just sort of weakens but if if if, um, if the person or the um, you know the the person that's being researched you know or the animal if it's given a break from uh, the constant um, uh, uh, being con constantly introduced to the um, uh, conditioned uh, stimulus then eventually it will strengthen again and uh, the uh, they, they call that spontaneous recovery so that reappears you know that's the reappearance of the previously extinguished conditioned response okay so uh, that leads us into after that you know um, this gentleman here this researcher named John Watson so Watson he founded the new approach that was called behaviorism and if you remember uh, from earlier chapters behaviorism refers to um, the the idea that psychology should be concerned with only observing behaviors because that's the only thing we can actually really observe now that is not um, what current researchers feel but uh, this this is just talking about how this evolved in psychology so here's an example of um, another type of conditioning you know um, classical conditioning like the smell of coffee so eventually just the smell of coffee just smelling it will um, you know in the or in the early stages one um, associated the smell of coffee with the effects that caffeine has on us but eventually just smelling the coffee without taste having any caffeine can still um, elicit the same response in us now another researcher here Garcia 
He was um, interested in the biological predispositions to learn. And all that means is, is that we have innate um, predispositions to uh, certain things. And so take, for instance, um, if, if you eat something and it makes you sick, it, it only takes that one time. And then um, often people, when they eat something, they get really sick from it they will never eat that food again. They became, uh, upon just one occurrence of that, um, they actually became conditioned very strongly. That's called biological preparedness. And I made a note here that says the organism is innately predisposed to form associations between stimuli and responses. Now here, uh, there's also a few other researchers here. You don't have to memorize the names of these researchers or anything, but um, if you would like to stop the video and just read through some of these examples, uh, this may give you further insight into this here. Okay, now we're going to move on to operant conditioning. So we, we're moving past uh, classical and we're going to talk about operant conditioning. And that means we uh, learn um, active voluntary behaviors by um, linking those with their consequences. So uh, in simple language, that means we just learn to do certain things according to their consequences. Our, you know, so we learn how to shape or alter our behavior according to their consequences. Like a good example is, um, say a student wants to get um, uh, straight A's in a semester, A's in every class, and they decide that they are going to study for four hours every day. Um, well, and then if they do, um, if the consequence is of that studying is that they indeed do get straight A's from all their classes in that semester, then they're more than likely going to continue with that behavior. That's called operant conditioning. Now, um, one thing I'd like to point out, though, that operant conditioning, you know, that is voluntary conditioning. Whereas, did you notice with classical conditioning, conditioning, that is involuntary type learning. Now, there was a researcher named Thorndike, and he was um, he researching operant conditioning. And uh, so he developed these things called um, a puzzle box, and he would put cats in those. And um, through trial and error, the cat would learn to eventually press the lever that would open the door and allow the cat to get to the food. And um, so that was operant conditioning. It was it was its behavior became gradually modified in order to um, get a uh, reach a certain goal or effect. Now, Skinner was another uh, behaviorist who was very popular there in the early 1900s through the mid 1900s. And uh, he was he was very interested in operant conditioning. And he felt that, you know, that actually um, when it comes to learning and behavior, that he believed that our internal thoughts and beliefs and emotions um, or our motivations really could not be used to uh, explain our behaviors. Uh, you know, that that is not reflective of current psychological um, research and understanding. Okay, so as a, uh, just to remind you, so operant conditioning, you know, that that's learning as a pro, it's a learning process in which our behavior is modified or shaped and maintained by their consequences. And uh, so sometimes things will re reinforce one's behavior. And that occur reinforcement occurs when the stimulus or an event follows, um, you know, an operant, a certain type of behavior, and increases the likelihood that the, of the, that operant or behavior being repeated. We'll take a look at this in just a little more. So there's two types of uh, reinforcement. There's positive and negative. So positive reinforcement, that is um, the response is followed by the addition of a reinforcing stimulus, increasing the likelihood that the response will be repeated in similar situations. 
So take, for instance, a positive reinforcer would be um, in the example of the student wishing to get straight A's um, and it stu the student studied for four hours per day throughout the semester. Well, upon receiving the A's, that would be considered a positive reinforcement. Now, on the other hand, a negative reinforcement that that you know that refers to the removal or avoidance or even escape from punishing stimulus and that um so take for instance um uh the the same student you know wished to get a's and did 4 hours a day of study but only ended up with c's and d's and so the student might, you know, likely say, look, that didn't work and uh, I'm going to avoid doing that again because, um, you know, the, the C's and D's just weren't acceptable to me. And uh, so sees those as negative types of reinforcement. So it's going to move, the, his behavior is going to change um, in accordance with that. Now, just to know, you know, this term aversive stimuli, that's just physical or psychological discomfort that an organism, organism seeks to escape or avoid. So that can be anything at all, you know, physically or psychologically that one wishes not to, um, that would, seeks, seeks to avoid. Let's just leave it at that. Now, reinforcement, that is, um, stimulus stimuli you know that's naturally or inherently reinforcing for a given species such as food water or biological necessities that is a those are what's called primary reinforcers so primary just means naturally inherently reinforcing or occurring that's why they, they use food water and other biological necessities but secondary those are what are conditioned reinforcer, reinforcers Okay, so here's a little chart here that gives you a comparison, you know, between positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. So uh, feel free to stop the video here and look at this here. We're going to move on in order to save time. So punishment. Now, uh, intuitively, we all know what, what punishment is, you know, but uh, so let's just, you know, uh, elaborate upon that just a little and punishment refers to aversive consequence that ways would decrease the likelihood of us repeating our behavior and there are two types of punishment there's um you know there's um punishment by application and so that's um when it, a an aversive stimulus is added afterward and that's called positive punishment and then punishment by removal that's also called that's called negative punishment and that's a situation um, in which be, one's behavior is followed by removal or subtraction by a reinforcing stimulus so here's something that's important to think about um, whenever you hear positive think of something being added to the scenario but think when you think hear the term negative just think of something being subtracted or removed from it hence the positive and negative signs okay here's another chart where you can uh, see some comparison once again feel free to pause the video here and look this over now really quickly here you know there are some problems with punishment you know the that they mention here and here's some alternatives to punishment uh, some of the problems with punishment you know it does not teach you know um, uh, or promote alternative or acceptable behavior um, so and it sometimes can uh, produce kind of undesirable behavior or results such as hostility passivity or fear um, and sometimes when one is punished, you know, the results are likely to be temporary. Um, and then on the right hand side here, they give alternatives to punishment and they give uh, four different strategies for you to look at. Please uh, take a look at these, gain a little more insight of the, to these on your own here.
Okay, so um, out off of this uh, slide right here, the main important thing I just would like for you to know is the the term called shaping, and this that refers to um, reinforcement um, gradually that occurs gradually. So as a um, as a person or an animal gets uh, successively closer, that means a little bit at a time, closer and closer to the goal. Uh, one is being reinforced as they get closer and closer to the goal. So um, a good example of that is um, take, for instance, one wants to get on the uh, dean's list at school or something. And uh, little by little, they'll start knowing what they need to do in each class to eventually achieve the ultimate goal of getting on the dean's list or something to that effect. That's just one example. Okay, this is something for you to uh, look at. Uh, once again, feel free to stop the video and take a look at this. We're moving on. So sometimes reinforcement, uh, that doesn't happen um, um, on a continuous basis. You know, uh, continuous reinforcement, that means uh, reinforcement that occurs every single time a response is being um, a desirable response is being reinforced and but partial reinforcement that refers to it not it only occurring uh, either once in a while um, not every single time uh, desired behavior is demonstrated we'll take a look at some of these a little more in, uh, in, uh, in just a bit so as we scan down here, here's some four terms that we're going to take a look at. Fixed ratio, schedule of reinforcement, variable ratio, schedule, fixed interval schedule, and variable interval schedule. So we'll take a look at each of these. And I created these here for you, the four types of reinforcement schedules. So one, fixed ratio. That is what is called a reinforcement schedule in which a reinforcer is delivered after a fixed number of responses has occurred. So I'll give you some examples here. Okay, there's uh, something for you to check out there. Um, actually, I'm going to move back here. So um, fixed ratio, all that means is, is let's, let's take, for instance, um, right there on the second line that's in blue, it says often used in work for a commission or rate of production. So take, for example, um, one will get $10 for every 100 newspapers sold. So 10 to a 100, that's a ratio. That's a, and so, if, and then if so, it will be fixed. So for every 100 newspapers sold, uh, the uh, salesperson will earn $10. That's called a fixed ratio type of reinforcement. Now, variable ratio, though, that's when the reinforcer is delivered after an average number of responses, which uh, it's kind of unpredictably uh, varied. So here's an example of variable ratio schedule, gambling. So, um, you know, so casino, you know, especially when one's doing the casino slots, you know, you can never tell when that's going to happen. It's variable ratio. So maybe... Um, the first time one will uh, pull down the lever 30 times and win, but the second time 75 times and win, but then the next time two times and win. So that's a variable ratio schedule. And here's just some another example here for you to look out. When you, so the fixed interval schedule, that's the reinforcement uh, schedule in which a reinforcer is delivered for the first response that occurs after a preset time interval. That's elapsed. Okay, so I know that's kind of wordy, but here's an example of a fixed interval schedule. Paychecks. So a fixed interval, take for instance, one gets one's paycheck every two weeks. Well, that's a fixed interval. That's a fixed interval schedule of reinforcement. Variable interval. So that means it's not uh, set at a specific interval, but it's more unpredictable. So a variable interval schedule um, could be this, like a pop quiz, you know. So that's a good example of a variable interval schedule. Okay, there's just a little more elaboration here for you to look at. 
And here's how um, you know very uh, applications of operant conditioning can occur in different uh, types of um, businesses or something. You know, so uh, this is just more for interest here. And so now we're into contemporary views of operant conditioning because we were looking more at you know for the early behaviorists and stuff. Now we're going to move into the uh, more contemporary views. And uh, so definitely. Contemporary psychologists, they definitely feel uh, and they, they're convinced that our cognitive processes play a very important role in our learning, that we actually, you know, make choices and we have we have specific cognitive processes that that contribute to our learning. So take, for instance, latent learning. So they say here, learning that's not immediately evident in an organism's behavior is known as latent learning. Well, actually, the type of learning that we do in school is usually latent learning because um, students will, uh, you know, sit, learn, then go off on their own and study and everything. But their knowledge really isn't demonstrated until they have an opportunity to demonstrate. Take, for instance, uh, like on an exam or a quiz or a paper that they write. That's why it's called latent learning. And there's another example of latent learning right here for you. So like forming mental pictures, you know, um, cognitive maps of one's neighborhood or how to get around. Someone asks you, uh, hey, how do I get over to uh, Main Street? And you say, oh, well, just go um, down 6th Avenue to, um, you know, Colorado, then take a left and then go ex approximately two miles and you'll reach Main Street. Well, see, um, that's latent learning because the person giving the directions, they are just now demonstrating their knowledge and they may not have even known that they know that, but they formed a cognitive map of their neighborhood. Okay, so some certain cognitive aspects to learning, you know, there's what's called learned helplessness and that is um, basically refers to um, when one is uh, completely exposed uh, often to uncontrollable or inescapable aversive events, you know, so the person will say, ah, oh, you know, what's the point? Um, you know, the thing, it never turns out right, you know, so I'm just going to give up. That's called learned helplessness. And uh, observational learning, that uh, refers to learning through observing, basically. And this, you know, take, for instance, on the top row right here, um, here is one that's called the Bobo doll experiment. Um, there, there was a researcher on the top row that um, demonstrated aggressive, violent behavior toward this uh, Bobo doll, and children were in another room watching. Well, afterward, they allowed the children in the room, and the children demonstrated the vi same violent behavior, so they learned uh, observationally. So, this just gives some factors that you're more likely to imitate uh, 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 observed behavior and they give you some examples. Uh, feel free to stop the video again and uh, look at these on your own. And last but not least here, we're going to talk about near, mirror neurons. That's how when we observe, we actually um, have parts of our brain called mirror neurons that actually um, play a role in um, processing and understanding and even feeling what we're uh, seeing and that's why we have things like empathy and things toward others and uh, so this gives an example here of what's called musical mirror neurons so you know stop the video and definitely read through this and look at these images of the uh, musical mirror neurons and that is it for our discussion so um, the next step, you know, is uh, definitely review this uh, video and uh, get your uh, accompanying study guide for this chapter and begin to uh, work on that, complete that. Thanks and good luck.